Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Travis Smith, and I'm filling in for Lamar Bailey, who is unable to join us today. I manage our security and compliance solutions team here at Tripwire, and I'm responsible for releasing security content for a variety of our products. I'm also joined by our Chief Technology Officer, Dave Meltzer. We'll wrap up the webinar with a Q&A session, so if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them via the chat throughout the presentation. Let's go ahead and get started. Our agenda today will start with discussing the shifting landscape of enterprise environments. We'll touch on cloud asset security and how that has been evolving throughout the last few years. I'll then pass over to Dave to talk about the state of cloud security with an interesting look into a case study for a bank's hybrid deployment. Then finally, we'll share a few key takeaways for today and get into the Q&A session. First up, I wanted to talk about the shifting landscape of enterprise environments over the last decade. On-premise solutions is something that's well understood. We've been doing this for decades. Cloud is a concept which has been challenging for businesses over the last few years. A few years ago, the perception was that cloud computing environments were less secure than on-premise environments. The reality is that for all organizations, except for perhaps those which are more well-resourced, infrastructure as a service has a ready potential to be substantially more secure than on-premise environments. The hybrid is a critical challenge where the responsibility model is shared between the organization and the service provider. Most organizations have been working on-premise for years and have slowly been shifting things into the cloud. But sometimes there's things you can't put up there. And that's the challenge on how to manage the security responsibility of a hybrid solution. One question that comes up often is, am I a hybrid environment? Cloud computing is one of the basic building blocks of modern companies. As renting and using virtualized resources in the cloud not only provides a high degree of flexibility, but also can save in-house IT departments a lot of effort. Does your organization utilize any of these? If you do, then you're a hybrid company. Now, who is securing them for you? At what level does the responsibility of security shift from the service provider to you? This is the AWS security model, which does an excellent job of visualizing where responsibilities lie. If you're not an AWS customer and you're interested, there are similar representations for Google Cloud or Azure. There's a common misconception that cloud providers handle all security, possibly left over from the era of hosting providers. The truth is, there's a lot of security that the customer is responsible for still. There are three sets of controls to be aware of. The first are inherited controls, and those are which the customer will fully inherit from the provider such as the physical and environmental controls. The next are shared controls. These apply to both the infrastructure layer and customer layers, but in completely separate contexts or perspectives. In a shared control, AWS will provide the requirements for the infrastructure, and the customer must provide their own control implementation within their use of the AWS services. For example, configuration management. AWS maintains the configuration of its infrastructure devices, but a customer is responsible for configuring their own guest operating systems, databases, and applications. Finally, there are customer-specific controls. These are the controls which the customer is solely responsible for based on the application they are deploying within the AWS services. For example, service and communications protection or zone security, which may require a customer to route or zone data within specific security requirements. The important takeaway from this model is that cloud provider is responsible for the security of the cloud while the customer is responsible for the security in the cloud. The three different services we're most concerned with are infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. There are differences between the three and what your responsibility will be. However, in the new hybrid cloud operational model, responsibility of security is always shared. In infrastructure as a service, the customer assumes the most responsibility. The service provider is renting out their own IT infrastructure and makes it available for use online. An example being running a Windows server in AWS or Azure. To do this, the cloud provider usually operates their own data centers where the corresponding hardware is stored, administered, and maintained. Uh, infrastructure as a service works according to the shared responsibility principle. Providers as well as customers need to take on different areas of responsibility in order to get the most out of the cloud resources. The provider is responsible for the structure, operation, and security of the hardware, uh, or also referred to as the physical environment. The customer, on the other hand, will be responsible for the virtual networking, operating systems, applications, data, and user management. In platform as a service, on the other hand, it is a complete scalable development deployment 
environment that is sold as a subscription service. An example of this is the AWS Lambda, uh, Azure Platform as a Service, and the Google App Engine. The platform includes all elements that a developer needs to create and run cloud applications, such as the operating system, programming languages, execution environment, database, and web server, all of which will reside in the cloud service provider's infrastructure. The provider is responsible for all of that, while the customer is then only responsible for the applications, the data, and the users. Software as a service companies inherently give up some ownership and control in order to reap the benefits of flexibility, scalability, and cost efficiency. Uh, examples of software as a solution is uh, Adobe Connect, ServiceNow, Google, Salesforce, and Microsoft's O365. In these examples, the service provider is responsible for everything all the way up to the application, leaving the customer responsible only for their users and the data. So what is moving to the cloud and how do we do it? It started with moving machines to the cloud, such as migrating from a local VMware cluster to AWS instances. Now organizations are starting to look at DevOps, where you may just need apps and libraries available in the cloud. As I just mentioned, organizations started out by moving whole systems to the cloud and virtualizing them. Running an entire system all the time is costly. So the next step was to break down the virtual machines into smaller containers with set tasks. This allows for cost savings by only having to run what is needed. It also makes the services easier to manage. From an engineering point of view, first it was Waterfall, and then next it was Agile, and now it's all about DevOps. DevOps focuses on the culture and responsiveness while emphasizing tools and automation. Some of you are probably doing some sort of DevOps, or at the very least talking about it to some degree. DevOps is the fusion of development and operations. Here in the center, we've got a fairly typical DevOps diagram, the type you've probably seen before. It shows a continuous path of all of the different stages of your software development lifecycle. People can use different names for these phases or stages, but they all tend down uh, to boil down to similar concepts. Planning, coding, building, testing, releasing, deploying, configuring, and monitoring. There are a lot of different moving parts in all of this and even more new tools being used. You may even be using some of these tools in your own environments. You might be using something like Docker or Kubernetes, or maybe you're using some development tools like Puppet, Ansible, or Chef. And you might be using hybrid cloud, both private and public, whether you're hosting your services in AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud. Tripwire has a lot of options for helping round out your DevSecOps practice. So what is DevSecOps versus regular old DevOps? The DevSecOps answer is that security fits in everywhere. Using the same DevOps diagram from before, we will follow the same lifecycle. However, the addition of the lock icon here is representing that we need security in each phase. So rather than making security a release gateway, something that only happens later in the stages of the release, security is going to be integrated into every part of the workflow. This is also referred to as shifting security to the left. Uh, it would make more sense if the di diagram were a straight line rather than this figure eight loop, but the idea is that security is getting pushed into earlier and earlier stages of the release pipeline, all the way back to the beginning in the planning stage. A big feature of DevSecOps is the ability to automate everything. You may be familiar with automated code quality tests or unit tests, which cover product functionality. We can also automate security tools to handle security testing before anything goes into production. The goal of shifting to the left is to make security be part of every uh, part of this process, specifically pushing automation wherever possible. Don't let IT or security be the bottleneck, otherwise developers were, are going to find a way around them. Transitioning to modern infrastructure is about more than just technology. It also represents a new method of developing and delivering code. The cost of bugs and security issues as they move through the delivery chain multiplies several times over each step. When securing containers throughout the entire build, ship, run lifecycle, it means shifting to the left. There are areas, three areas which pose the most risk when we're talking about something like containers. The first is shipping containers with an unacceptable risk. A container may have a known vulnerability or configuration weakness which may be abused by an attacker. Uh, in the ever-evolving world we live in, there is also stored container images within our repositories, which may be susceptible to a newly announced vulnerability. And then finally, using traditional tools for DevSecOps uh, may not be suitable for the challenge of trying to securing these containers in this DevOps world. 
By understanding the CI-CD pipeline, security teams can see where it makes sense to put security controls in place and how they can match to existing DevOps workflows. However, getting buy-in from developers to think about security uh, is the number one challenge. Developers don't want to be interrupted, and most of the time, they don't want to be the reason behind an outage. It's going to ruin their street cred. To get around this, uh, we need to set up something like a tiger team, which has uh, DevOps, security, and engineers who are you know, well-respected within their own groups and can be the champions within their teams to talk about these things. A security person should be ready for an engineer to come up to him and say he can't wait 20 hours, 24 hours for something. You're going to have to figure out a way to get it done immediately. The goal is, is if you can't automate it, you have to be faster. Checking the source code being committed into the, the CI is a good first measure but you need to address the overall application infrastructure as it moves throughout the pipeline. It's not just code going through the CI-CD process. Operating systems, third-party components, middleware, and databases are being built and deployed along with that code. The most effective way to integrate security tools with the CI-CD build tools uh, and configuration tools, combining tools such as Jenkins or TeamCity uh, with something like Puppet and Chef uh, to fully automate these assessments. The assessments can either stop the issues from continuing down the pipeline, uh, or at the very least, provide visibility into the risk the business is going to be accepting. Uh, just as important as preventing issues from going into production, organizations will want to monitor and maintain the integrity of their production environments. I'll now hand it over to Dave Meltzer, Tripwire CTO, to talk more about these challenges and how we have been working with our customers to address them here at Tripwire. Thanks, Travis. That was a lot of great information. I'm now going to shift gears a little bit and talk more about the practical challenges, tooling, and solutions that we can use to address some of the different security and compliance issues that Travis raised in the prior slides. When we start talking about the solutions, one of the terms that you may start to hear around the industry is cloud security posture or cloud security posture management. What that is at a high level is just an understanding that we have applications that are made up of a myriad of different services in the cloud today. And if we want to maintain a secure, compliant posture on those, we need some way of assessing how are these applications made up? What are the different services and how are they configured? Where are the risks in the individual services and the connections between those services? And the assessment of all of that is something that we are now calling in the industry cloud security posture management. Uh, that's a term that uh, organizations like Gartner are now using uh, to describe this space. You remember Travis talked a minute ago about the shared security responsibility model. And here's the bad news about that model. According to Gartner, at least 95% of cloud security failures will be the customer's fault, meaning it, those are failures that are happening above the line of that shared security responsibility model. Now, one optimistic way to think about this is to say that the public cloud providers are doing a really good job at securing things below that line. But the reality is that there is so much above the line for many applications, including uh, configuration, uh, what are your user permissions, uh, how are your services connecting together, that all of these different things actually make it much more difficult than people originally anticipated it would be as they migrated applications into the cloud. It also means that customers really are responsible for bringing some of their own security tooling into many of these cloud environments. So let's spend a minute talking about what are these common mistakes that do lead to those above the line security issues. Direct connectivity to services on the internet, for example, you see these thousands of MongoDB databases that are publicly accessible. Uh, common mistake, people don't realize uh, exactly where and how some of these things are being deployed, uh, or they get migrated from one place to another, and it's really easy to leave the wrong ports or services open as you do these deployments. Similarly, leaving uh, an SSH or a remote desktop publicly accessible uh, on the internet, there are all sorts of crawlers that are looking for these things nonstop particularly at the public cloud providers, and so that's a common mistake we find as well. Data store exposures, so when you think about the uh, Amazon S3 buckets with the wrong permissions or your Azure storage blob service has publicly exposed things, that we're seeing all sorts of breaches for 
Uh, and that one is probably actually the number one most common mistake we're seeing today across public internet services. Similarly, the lack of proper access control, uh, giving too much information out to too many different accounts or users or roles within an application. Certainly, uh, we've learned over time in security that a concept of least privilege is very critical to maintain a secure application, meaning only give the users, the groups, and the roles the access that they absolutely need to have and nothing more. And if you take that approach, uh, you can avoid these common mistakes of, uh, for instance, having a normal user inadvertently be able to get some administrative data out of the system. Lastly, lack of encryption. Uh, encryption obviously can happen at a number of different levels across a public cloud service. It can happen at the hardware level. Uh, that may be useful if you're worried about someone stealing a drive out of a data center. Uh, on the other hand, more application level encryption, making sure that an inadvertent user wouldn't have access to these systems could be a common issue that you want to take a look at. So when it comes to implementing a cloud security posture management uh, tooling for your public cloud usage, here are a couple of the key aspects that you need to be focused on. First, uh, make sure that you have secure configuration at each cloud provider account. Uh, when you were talking about using the public cloud, and I'll start with the big public cloud providers being AWS, Azure, and GCP, each one of those have accounts you can log into, configuration settings having to do with the account level access into the applications. And if you don't lock down that account with the proper security, you're going to leave all of the applications and different services within the cloud provider exposed. Within those accounts, you can go back to the basics of security and think about what do I need to know? Uh, are they configured properly in accordance with best practices? Uh, best practices could be coming from third-party sources like the Center for Internet Security. It could be your own internal cloud account team's guidelines or it could be what the vendors themselves are recommending in terms of setup. Uh, if you don't have the right configurations, that can lead to a, a lot of those common mistakes that we talked about before. One of the other concerns for a lot of organizations is because they're taking a very hybrid approach, meaning we're doing a combination of different kinds of services, both within our own environment as well as the public cloud, we need to have some way of getting holistic visibility. So one of the challenges uh, people often find when they get started in the cloud is they'll start using just the native tools from a single uh, cloud provider, but then another application will get stood up and it'll be using different sets of services, and then they'll stand up another application and that will go on a different cloud provider. And now they have a hybrid environment where they have to retool things across multiple cloud providers each time that they're starting to stand up new services. So one of the important considerations that a lot of large companies are taking is, how can I get holistic visibility? How can I monitor and manage a lot of these configurations at this account and service level without having to do something that's very specialized uh, for each service? I would kind of go back to the traditional way that we did security and say, well, at some point we started with different tooling so that our Linux servers got monitored one way and our Solaris servers got monitored a different way and then our Windows systems had a totally different set of tools. And by the way, the switches had their own tools. Well, at a certain point, everyone realized, yeah, you know, that's a really difficult way to actually manage the security of your organization, to have different tools for every different platform. And so the question becomes, what can give me holistic visibility? How do I get visibility across all of these different accounts? Uh, all those systems on my on-premise data centers and server farms, which many of them haven't gone away, but now I'm also adding many of these different cloud providers and services as well. Uh, how does I make it all work together is really the question. Some people refer to this as the swivel chair problem. Now, in my current work from home environment, I think I would love to have a desktop that looks just like this with this many monitors. And certainly we're probably used to this kind of configuration in our, our NOC or our SOC environments. But at the same time, this also just illustrates the problem that uh, many organizations have, which is I have so many front end dashboards consoles because I need so many different disconnected tools to gather a lot of this information. So let's use our extensive desktops and multiple monitors 
to get all the information that we need, but let's consolidate it down to the minimum number of tools we need to actually solve the problem. So let me talk a little bit about a case study, and this happens to be a Tripwire customer that is a large multinational bank with a hybrid cloud environment that is a combination of on-premise virtualization, private cloud, and public cloud services. First, let's talk about what this financial services firm's business needs or requirements were for the solution that they were trying to build. First, the core of their requirement was dependable risk assessment and configuration control, understanding where the risks were uh, based upon vulnerability, misconfiguration, security settings across their hybrid environment, both virtualization, private cloud, and public cloud providers. They wanted to reduce the attack surface of systems that were getting deployed into their production environment and do that by directly integrating into their DevOps teams and tool chains, taking the shift left approach that Travis talked about earlier. When systems were deployed, they had to meet their approved image risk levels and be properly configured or else they would not be allowed into production. And they wanted that all to happen on an automated basis. When systems were getting stood up and down on a frequent basis in the cloud to meet elastic demand, they wanted to be able to understand what was happening in that environment, what changes were occurring, and how did those changes impact the security and compliance posture of their systems. And finally, when they did see a change happen to a system, they needed to know immediately what was the vulnerability risk that was created uh, or even mitigated by the change that had just occurred. The organization felt if they could meet these requirements, they could reduce the manual time and effort they were spending while meaningfully improve their security posture as additional applications migrated to the cloud. Now let's go back to the DevSecOps process that Travis talked about earlier and see how that maps to what this organization was seeking to build in a secure DevSecOps process. If we start at that build layer, number one, what we saw was virtual images being assessed for configuration compliance and vulnerabilities before they ever hit that deployment pipeline. The value of that was continuous integration systems would allow them to immediately see if a developer introduced a new problem in the code and it would never get deployed into production, meaning the security risk never made its way into a real world environment. From the deployment stage, if it did pass its security assessment, then it could move forward into the production operations. At that point in time, we could monitor for changes on those production systems to see, did it ever go out of that secure state that we knew that it started in once it got produced uh, and once it got built and deployed? Once we saw a monitoring uh, change, we could then do that immediate assessment again, and if necessary, deliver that information back to the developer or back to the DevOps team where we could either roll back to unknown good state or we could do an additional deployment fix to address that security issue. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing organizations take more of an automated approach to looking at potential remediation in cloud environments, although remediation in an automated way has been something security tools have been able to do for, for many years. It's been something that we've actually seen in real world use, very little adoption of. And that's because the ops teams who are delivering and deploying new tools has traditionally been a different group of people than the security assessment team that's actually finding these issues. And that's really one of the benefits of this DevOps or DevSecOps approach. When we get all of the groups working together, we can find techniques that will reduce manual effort reduce the cost of these handovers between teams and ultimately build us a more secure posture. I'll finish up the presentation now by spending a minute talking about what Tripwire does in terms of the different challenges that Travis and I have been talking about today. Think of Tripwire as that invisible line of defense that's keeping your system safe. We've been trusted by the world's leading organizations for over 20 years, and today's Tripwire solutions are working 
in hybrid environments across the world, covering a variety of different on-premise physical and virtualization platforms, as well as the leading private and public cloud providers that your different applications are often migrating to today. We've been a technology pioneer for decades now, and let me dig into some of the specific capabilities that we provide in this hybrid environment type of area. No matter how your application is being built and where it's being deployed, there are some key things that you need to know in order to protect yourself. You need to know what systems you have, what applications are running, and what make up those applications, when you're vulnerable in those applications, when suspicious changes are occurring that could be unauthorized, malicious, or suspicious, and how is the settings and the configuration of your different applications in compliance with your security policies, whether that be your internal standards, external best practices, vendor recommendations, or just generally the things that are going to keep you secure. With Tripwire, you know. Tripwire's leading capabilities cover you across hybrid environments in these key areas, providing asset discovery, vulnerability management, secure configuration management, change detection, integrity monitoring, and policy and compliance management. It's providing many of those core capabilities you need to assess your level of risk and manage your risk across your hybrid environment. Tripwire provides a capability integrated into our flagship Tripwire Enterprise product called the Cloud Management Assessor. The Cloud Management Assessor ensures the secure configuration of your public cloud services including out-of-the-box support for AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud Platform, as well as different storage services that are sitting in those platforms. So whether you want to know whether your AWS account is configured in accordance with CIS best practices, or you have an application that was deployed to Azure, and you need to make sure that you're not publicly exposing your Azure storage block buckets to the public internet, or you have different kinds of platform services that you're using across multiple cloud providers, and you're trying to get some level of understanding of how are these systems configured, what are the changes happening in these configurations and permissions, and what's going to be the security implication of those changes, Tripwire Cloud Management Assessor provides that capability. And for the hybrid environments that many of our customers are operating in today, this information flows back and sits alongside the same kind of information that we're assessing for physical assets, virtualization and assets, and applications running in your private cloud in addition to public cloud services. With that brief overview of the Tripwire solutions, I'd like to now bring back Travis Smith to join me and talk about what are some of the key takeaways from the presentation. Let's talk about some of the key takeaways from the presentation. The first one, if security is a bottleneck, expect to be avoided. Uh, what does that mean, Travis? Yeah, I mean, nobody wants to be a bottleneck in any part of the business, uh, you know, especially security. Uh, you know, we, we, as I was talking about earlier, uh, anytime security is a bottleneck, it's going to slow things down. And the whole purpose of DevOps and DevSecOps is to be quick and nimble and agile and get things released. Uh, so, you know, if security is a bottleneck, then you can expect developers to try to figure out a way to work around uh, security. Uh, and in the end, they're going to try to get something released because that's what their job is to do. Uh, and that's going to just cause security issues down the road that are going to be more expensive to fix. Yeah, sometimes the security teams are the no guys. Uh, but, you know, increasingly, we want to find ways that security can be the enablers, help you move things to production faster than you could before particularly in the older models of security where you spend a lot of time doing threat modeling and doing a lot of manual review of your applications before you let them into production. If you can automate that process, your application developers are actually going to be really happy with the security team. Absolutely. Next Automation takeaway. is key. Yep. DevOps will continue to grow. Implement security solutions that work at the speed of DevOps. Uh, what is the speed of DevOps, Travis? 
No, as I just touched on, the speed of DevOps, the whole purpose of it is to get things out quickly uh, and get things out fast, right? The what a term that I've used uh, in my uh, distant past is uh, launch and iterate, right? Just get the get the product out, get a feature out, uh, and ship it. Uh, and see how it is. You don't need to get the entire thing done, right? If you look at the the scope of a security project and secure, uh, securing uh, an application or uh, some type of system that we're trying to deploy, uh, you could spend an entire year looking at how to secure it, uh, looking at tools to secure it, the processes, and all that kind of stuff. And at the end of that year, there, you're going to still have a whole list of backlog items that you need to get to. Um, so the the whole purpose of speed of DevOps is just adopt that mentality and 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 work quickly and and get address the most you know, risky things to whatever you're working on and get those out as quickly as you can. Yep, I, I like that idea of uh, ship fast and iterate. The, the term I've often heard used for DevOps is uh, move quickly and break things. Uh, and while that might uh, scare security people sometimes, uh, it's actually a really good thing to try and break things from a security perspective in the, the staging or the build environments before we deploy into our production environment. Next one, uh, hybrid environments require hybrid solutions. Um, why are hybrid solutions so important? Yeah, hybrid solutions are important uh, simply because we're all using them. Uh, most businesses, uh, and I would dare to say pretty much all businesses at this stage in in uh, in life, are hybrid at, at some point. Um, so they're using tools that are you know, your traditional tools that we've had on premise for decades, uh, or these you know these new tools that are in the in the cloud type environments, so your O365 or AWS, those types of things. Uh, and you know the tools that were traditionally built to secure your on-premise deployments aren't really well suited uh, to address the the problems that we face in the cloud. Uh, and you know similarly, these tools that are specifically built to secure uh, for the cloud uh, aren't really uh, well suited to address on-premise problems that we have. Um, so you need to have uh, you know a set of tools uh, in your you know your your workbench there, you know, so to speak, that can address both of these, and it's going to require a hybrid uh, mindset of how do you bring these two tools, you know, these two sets of tools together in a hybrid way. Yeah, when you when you think about trying to bring together uh, my AIX servers in my data center with my Amazon S3 storage bucket sitting in the public cloud, uh, that's where the hybrid solutions really share the value. Stop buying swivel chairs. Uh, I talked a little bit before about uh, this need for visibility across many different platforms and not wanting to need a wall of monitors just to figure out uh, what's happening in my environment. Uh, how do we stop buying swivel chairs? Yeah, I mean, the the whole purpose of stop buying swivel chairs really is, I mean, we have a whole bunch of solutions that do something really well. Um, and so we had a specific problem, and you looked up the best vendor for that specific problem, then you just bought another solution, which just added another monitor to your sock, uh, which, you know, in theory is, is a good thing because now you've addressed the solution that you have, but it's just wasting the analyst time because they're just going from solution to solution to solution to, to try to f solve these different problems. Uh, and in reality, they just, you know, you know, single pane of glass is, uh, you know, in an ideal world, that's never really going to be possible. But reducing the amount of tools you have is, is usually better, um, or at the very least, uh, looking at a way to bring all of your tools into a centralized location to to speed things up. When an analyst is is trying to uh, track down malware, you know, an APT group, uh, you know, trying to switch between tools and and the mindset around trying to do that is very difficult and it's costly and it's going to waste time and money. Yeah, I, I often talk to CISOs who talk about the idea of capability consolidation and uh, trying to get more focus and, and and then we layer on the new services in the public cloud and we go the opposite direction. Uh, we're starting to add more and more capability and add more complexity to the environment. Uh, last bullet here, DevOps is good, but DevSecOps is better. What, what's the key to DevSecOps uh, to make it work for a, a, a real-life organization, Travis? The, I mean, the key there is really, you know, is making security part of the entire process. Uh, and not only that, is making it part of the process from the beginning, right? As I mentioned earlier today, uh, shifting to the left and making sure security is talked about at the very beginning. If you're going to be introducing security at the beginning of something, it's going to be a lot cheaper and a lot uh, more efficient than adding it uh, later in the end. Uh, I like to think of it as building like a pyramid, right? And if you need to have security, um, it's easier to have that when you're building it in the bottom rather than trying to add it uh, when you're already building the, the apex of that pyramid and try to sh you know, shove something down in the bottom. It's going to be a lot harder to do to, to add a stone to the bottom of a pyramid than it is to just build it from the bottom up. Yep, that, that makes a lot of sense. And from my perspective, 
you know, DevOps more than anything is really a philosophy. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about the tools uh, and the process of the technology. Uh, but when you add security into that DevOps process, you know, more than anything, it's really just about that collaboration uh, and about getting the security team involved early on in that process, uh, exactly as you were talking about. Um, well, great. Let's uh, let's move on. Thanks everyone for joining us on the webinar today. We're gonna to move into a Q&A period, uh, but if you wanna get more information about anything we covered today, check out our website at uh, tripwire.com. You can follow us on social media. Uh, the State of Security blog Tripwire offers has a lot of great information and a lot of timely information about the, uh, the changing environment that we have here in 2020 as well. All right, thanks Dave. Uh, so now that we're wrapped up, uh, we'd like to get to the Q&A section of today. Uh, we've seen some uh, questions come in via the chat uh, section. So if you have any questions, feel free to open up the, the chat portion of the, the UI here uh, and submit your questions and we will get to them. Um, so let's go ahead and get to our first question. Okay. So if you have any questions, there is the Q&A portion again. Um, so if you do have any of those, feel free to uh, drop those in. And we already have a couple in that I can see here. We can get to the first uh, couple as some of the more questions roll in. So the first question we have here is, if you do see a security uh, bottleneck within your organization, uh, what can you do to, uh, to change that and have it implemented well? Um, so I mean, for me, I think that would be, uh, a lot of this comes down to 